one of the specific calls to action of the TRC that was taken up um, was a national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, so this is something you might have heard of a little bit, and we talked about sort of victimization among domestic violence. Um, the RCMP sort of nationally acknowledge that there are between, that there's about 1,200 uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls where they either don't know who, like, they don't know if this person was killed and they don't know how or by who. Um, indigenous communities argue that that could be more like 4,000. And when we're talking about this number, they're talking about exclusively between 1990 and 2012. Okay. Um, and this is sort of a lot of different things going on simultaneously. Um, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry is still going on, um, but it is sort of one of the TRC calls that has been taken up. Um, there's some challenges about this. So one of the reasons why the numbers are so high about women who are missing or murdered that remain unsolved, for example, um, is the underreporting of violence against Indigenous women and girls. Um, so there's a challenge, and we talk about a lot of reasons for this, um, but the Indigenous women and girls are less likely than other women to report violence being sort of done against them. Some of this is about not trusting police and authority figures, and we sort of talked about that a little bit earlier on. Um, but some of that is also about a perception, whether real or imagined, like but whether that is based in reality or not, that the authorities will not take those allegations seriously. Um, so, for example, this could be related to stereotypical beliefs that Indigenous women are just more sexual. So if they report sexual assault, um, the police are maybe more likely or they are perceived to be more likely to sort of say, well, are you sure you didn't lead him on um, instead of that kind of piece? Um, or to sort of say like, oh, well, you're not really hurt instead of sort of working with that kind of stuff. There are also a lot of allegations from Canada's Indigenous community that part of the problem is that the police are very quick to rule the deaths of Indigenous women and girls as not suspicious um, rather than investigating further. So, for example, there's a case I was reading about a couple of months ago now about an Indigenous woman who apparently fell from her balcony window um, to her death, she died, um, and the police ruled her death not suspicious, although she had changed the locks on her apartment three times in the past two or three months, um, and had been telling the police that she felt like people were threatening her, um, and she'd been telling her family that, you know, there was a problem with someone she had known from work and that kind of thing. And the police looked at that and said, oh, that's a suicide. She jumped from her balcony window. Um, and there's some challenges with that kind of conversation because the allegation is anyway that if she had been a white woman instead of an indigenous woman, they would have gone, wait a minute, she changed her locks three times in the past couple of months. We need to figure out if she was being like if if she was responding to an actual threat um, before we just decide that she out of the blue committed suicide by jumping off her balcony window um, and that kind of conversation is pretty common there's all of that sort of awful history for example about robert picton um, for those of you who don't know that story um, you're welcome to look it up although i will say it is pretty gruesome um, but in the longest short of it is that one of canada's sort of most prolific serial killers, pretty intentionally victimized um, indigenous women and girls, especially those who had been working in the sex trade on the assumption that they wouldn't be missed, that no one would come looking for them. Um, so there's that kind of piece. Um, when we talk about indigenous women and girls, uh, we're also talking about things like how they are treated in incarceration. So we are talking about some cases that are legitimately suicides, but they are suicides after, for example, people have been kept in solitary confinement without access to other human beings for months on end. Um, some really like, and those, for those of you who sort of study any of that kind of correctional stuff, like that's not good for anyone's mental health. 
Um, and so there's some challenges in terms of this missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls question that part of what's happening is that the justice system is making existing problems worse in ways that disadvantage Indigenous women and girls. Um, so when we kind of talk about this, there's some numbers that are important here. Um, indigenous women are 3.5 times as likely as other women to experience violence, but seven times more li as likely to be homicide victims. Um, so they're, and, and that's, again, when we're not talking about these sort of 1,200, 4,000, somewhere between 1,200 and 4,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls where we don't know. Um, sort of, I mean, if this person is missing, do we know if they've been murdered or not? And that means that they're not included in those statistics in that sort of space. So one of the things that's important to understand in this process, and this is part of what's coming out in this national inquiry, is that the people who are interested in victimizing people, i.e. the people who feel the need to act out their rage, their sexual fantasies, whatever it is, at the expense of someone else, are aware that Indigenous women are less likely to become the subjects of serious police investigations, i.e. if something happens to them, the police aren't going to pull out all the stops to fix the problem. Um, so, for example, a lot of these women and girls are being victimized by non-Indigenous men, um, who men who are predatory in nature, um, and there's some really awful sort of details in cases of something like that where you have someone who has been a serial offender and has sort of done the same thing six or seven times, but if you do it five times to Indigenous women and then the sixth time is a pretty white blonde woman, um, then the police pull out all the stops and find them and go, oh yeah, and he committed these six other things first because we didn't look for the first five times that they did it. Um, so there's that kind of challenge. Um, so there's a lot of stereotypes that play into this and part of the sort of ethnocentrism that is associated with colonialism in Canada and sort of in other parts of the Western world is that part of civilization is sort of stepping away from sort of baser human instincts, i.e. Um, part of civilization is learning to control one's sexual urges. And if you start from that premise and then you assume that indigenous people are less civilized, one of the consequences you come to is that indigenous people are more fundamentally sexual and more likely to be sexually active. This is part of, for example, one of the reasons why you needed a pass to leave the res reserve as an indigenous person up until the 1960s or so, because there was a perception that indigenous men were going to sexually assault non-indigenous women because they had no control over their sexual urges. In the case of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, this sort of comes out more as an assumption that Indigenous women and girls are more interested in sexual contact and are interested in different kinds of sexual contact, whether that is sexual contact that includes more violence, whether that is sexual contact with people they have, they have met more recently, any number of things. And that perception is actually a difficult, is actually a problem on sort of two sides. So on the one hand, if you are a sexual predator or interested in that kind of activity, and that's something that you're interested in doing, the perception that Indigenous women are going to be more receptive to that means sort of takes you in that direction, right? You're more likely to assault an Indigenous woman. But that perception also sort of affects Indigenous women and girls on the justice side, because if the police officers, whether male or female, whether Indigenous or not, right, these are sort of prejudices and, and, and biases that affect everyone, um, if you believe that Indigenous women and girls are fundamentally more sexual than white women or non-Indigenous women, then you're less likely to believe them when they say, no, I didn't want to have sex with that person. Or, you know, no, I wasn't flirting with them. They assaulted me. Because you're going to assume, like, you're going to be looking for this sort of, like, small pieces in this, in their, in their descriptions of what happened that suggest that they were looking for it, that they were interested in having sex. And that is sort of part of the challenge 
Um, and the other sort of part of that is connected to the sort of broad instability of Indigenous communities. So one of the challenges when we talk about, for example, missing emergent Indigenous women and girls is what is that sort of missing category, right? So there are a lot of cases across the country where families will come to police officers, to, to police departments and the RCMP and say, hey, uh, my 15 year old girl is missing. I don't know where she is. And there has been a lot of documented cases of the police saying, well, are you sure she didn't just run away? And sort of to treat them, to treat these people as if they had been, as if they had left of their own volition, rather than saying, hey, that's six, that's six people from, you know, the, under 21 who disappeared from this community in the last four or five years. Is this a trafficking problem? Do we have people who are abducting women and girls from this community for to engage them in sex work, to sort of like isolate them, to sort of for purposes of abuse, like what is going on here? That sort of question isn't always being asked because of those sort of stereotypes and assumptions. Um, that is not a complete uh, sort of history yet. We're still working on this missing and murdered indigenous women and girls sort of piece. I just want you guys to be, a, you all to be aware of this process um, and that this is something that we're still investigating and that in a lot of ways, although we have a TRC on residential schools, there's still a lot of issues um, in terms of Canada's Indigenous population that we are just digging into and we really still haven't started to address in sort of a lot of meaningful ways. Um, notably, um, this is sort of a visual indicator. If you've ever seen uh, sort of red dresses hanging from trees and have, have wondered why that is, um, the Red Dress Project was started is as a memorial for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls to sort of talk about all of these dresses that they never got to wear um, and sort of to, to, to mark that these women are still people and they're sisters and, and mothers and daughters and friends and that they're still missing and we don't know what's happened to them and that that is a problem in and of itself. So that is sort of our like issues, I guess, in Indigenous communities. Next week and the next second half of this unit, we're going to talk all about treaty negotiations and sort of what some other contemporary pieces look like.